What is up, Shark Nation? Welcome to another episode of the Shark Pod Live from Greystone Studios. Uh, we've got our, our co-host out there, uh, Glenn Aguirre, Mark Baker. How are you doing, Mark? Super, Luke. How are you? Fantastic, fantastic. Excited about our guest today. Uh, he's on the line, Norman Crowley. How are you doing, Norman? I'm doing great. I've just clocked that we have a, a kind of South Dublin Wicklow triangle going on there between in the scary Greystones. <laughs> that trifecta. Uh, Oh, we've got, yeah, uh, yeah. we've got it. We've got it all, all uh, kind of, uh, uh, kind of locked down here. But like, I think it, it's. We were just saying this before. There's a lot of things going on in Wicklow right now. A lot of uh, new businesses and stuff like that. So it's been a very, it's been a very, uh, uh, you know, rich area for us to kind of dig into on the Shark Pod. Um, but just to give people uh, a background of, of Norman, um, we've done a lot of research on Norman today as well when he was coming on. Um, we talked. We th- thought about the uh, the gaming uh, group that you uh, sold successfully uh, for half a billion uh, half a billion dollars. So we might dig into that a little bit because maybe you can give us some tips about how to build the next uh, <laughs> huge gaming uh, business, so we can kick off with that. Um, but also um, uh, Crowley uh, Carbon, which is really really interesting space to be in. Uh, it seems like it's going incredibly well. Um, and we like to dig into that just to learn a little bit more about how um, how Irish businesses can maybe tap into the the climate change uh, opportunity. I think that it's a it's, it's a huge one. Um, I think that you know uh, Ireland we we've got a lot of uh, things going for us, but maybe this is something that we could uh, you know focus on a little bit more uh, for want of a better word. But um, maybe you wouldn't mind giving giving the, the the listeners just a like a few sentences about yourself to give us give you some context. Yeah, and Norman Crowley, born in West Cork in Clonakilty, just outside of Clonakilty, um, moved to Dublin uh, frighteningly probably about 30 years ago. Um, and uh, I've been in business all my life. I set up my first business when I was 15, grew up on a farm, um, and my dad taught me how to weld. And so I set up a welding business when I was 15. Um, and I've, I've kind of always, I guess, one was fascinated about business and innovation and engineering. And so, um, got out of that business, sold it when I was 20, um, and then set up a company called Trinity Commerce. Trinity Commerce became one of the first internet companies in Ireland and sold it to Aircom in uh, 1999, um, and so I retired actually when I was 28 years old um, and then realized that it wasn't really about the money all the time. It was about the work. <laughs> and um, and so set up a, that gaming company you were talking about, Inspired Gaming Group. Um, and we invented a technology and for the gaming world called server-based gaming. And we were the kind of inventors of that worldwide. And that business grew very quickly. So set up in, in 2000 um, with a team of eight, grew it to two and a half thousand people um, in six or seven years, floated yeah. on London Stock Exchange in 2006, and then exited the business in, in 2008, sold it to private equity for, yeah, the much vaulted half a billion bucks. Yeah, that was back when half a billion bucks was a lot of money. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Chump change that. No, it's, <laughs> well, it's, it's pretty good. It? It's a morning's valuation rise for Tesla. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Tesla, yeah. That, that's what I said. Sometimes you look at the, the Tesla stock and you're like, okay, uh, Elon made 35 billion today with a B. Yeah. You know, this type of crazy. Uh, yeah, crazy yeah, 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 yeah. It's amazing yeah. considering everyone thought he was an asshole about four years ago. <laughs> so, this is. Yeah, it, it's. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah so people who followed him from the beginning are being well rewarded now yeah <laughs> so the let's go back to the just the, the I don't, sorry i know you, we're gonna get so much to cover here at, at the beginning yeah. the first internet business uh, so you go from welding you sell that and how did you get into it, the kind of that type of innovation from there was it yeah, we, we always loved yeah we always loved computers as kids like we had a spectrum 48k which uh, there are probably people on will remember what that was it's probably the the power of the, the AirPods I'm talking on now <laughs> um, in terms of computing. And we always loved computers and we used to write code as kids. And so when we got out of welding, we got out of welding because it's just a, it's, it's a cold and miserable business in, in Ireland to be doing that kind of work outside. And, um, and so we always loved software and things like that. And so we just literally started selling computers. And I, like I've, like I've gone from, you know, welding to 
computers to gaming to climate change now and and cars and and all of that and and you know it's just important to i find i struggle to stay in the one thing for any longer than 10 years um because it's just you know um it's nice to learn new things and new challenges and we find it easy to the older we get the, the easier we find it to get into new businesses because you have a bit of a reputation and also business has the same rules regardless of what you're doing. Um, and then it's nice to learn new stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. And the, you mentioned the, the server based gaming just, so would that be um, like games that you'd. Uh, no, it's, ga- it's proper grown up gambling. So as okay. opposed to, as opposed to playing PlayStation five. So, um, so before we came along in the world of gambling, you had a slot machine and the slot machine had a game. And then the only way, if you wanted to play a different game, the only way to do that was swap out the machine for another machine. And we didn't know anything about gaming, um, but we we felt that that was a bit silly, right? To have one game on one machine, it didn't make any sense. And so because we were from the internet, <laughs> um, we said like, why don't you just put multiple games on the machine and download new games um, over the internet. And gaming, gam- gambling gaming is very highly regulated. And so it's not that easy. Um, um, but we built the first server-based gaming platform, which was a huge success. So we, you know, um, we quadruple the income of a gaming machine basically pretty much overnight. Uh, and, the, and the business grew very fast on the back of that. And by 2006, we were in 16 countries, two and a half thousand people. In the UK, we had 80% market share of every slot machine that was operating in the country. Okay. So, yeah, um, and we were supplying Vegas and, um, and Macau and all the glamorous places in the world. <laughs> so, all those business trips to Macau just to make sure everything's... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, kinda... My life, I've kind of said this uh, before, but my life was... In, in 2008, my life was get up in the morning and Monday in Dublin, head over to HQ in London. Um, then every third week, fly to Hong Kong, fly eight cities around Hong Kong in a private jet. And every 12th week, fly on to Melbourne and then fly back. And it sounds incredibly glamorous, but it was an absolute mess. I was like 18 and a half stone and, and pretty unhappy. <laughs> um, but obviously from the outside, it all looked very glamorous, you know. Absolutely, because that's what people, the, the private jets and stuff, that's kind of what people are chasing. And then, uh, but, you know, I'm sure there was some uh, some good times along the way, maybe. Oh, well. there definitely was. And, and you know, there are certain things in life that, like having a driver, having a private jet um, are, are things that you never take for granted. And I, and I don't have a private jet. Um, we were we were only renting. But um, every time you walked onto one, you smiled. Every time somebody opened the door for you to get into a car, you smiled, you know, so... Um, <laughs> But it kind of ended, as I'm sure you've heard the story, but it kind of ended spectacularly. Well, it ended financially very well, but it ended spectacularly from a, uh, in 2007, a hedge fund tried to buy out our business, um, offered us a billion bucks for it. We agreed to sell. And then um, all of that uh, transaction was happening during the global financial crisis. Lehman Brothers had just gone under. And we almost sold the business for a billion bucks, and then we just ran out of time in the end. And so we were, we were spectacularly, we were about twenty-four hours away from selling the business for a billion bucks. Oh. <laughs> um, and I, it was funny when I moved when I moved back to Ireland. A journalist was interviewing me, and they said, uh, "You know, we'd sold the business for half a billion bucks, which is about a hundred times more than we'd ever hoped to sell it for." And the journalist said, "Where did it all go wrong in the end?" <laughs> Should I put a, bit, you know, you put a bit of <laughs> pessimism like, like I could have been a billion and then they're they're sitting there yeah. you know, in their uh, Honda Civic driving away um, so, yeah. Uh, so yeah, hard, hard to judge <laughs> yeah and it, I think it taught us humility that transaction not working out uh, it, it, ironically it's probably the best thing that ever happened because it taught us a lot about ourselves and, and what we needed to do you know and um, and then you move on from there and so that kind of led to what we're doing now, which was like at that point, along the way as well, we we set up a business called The Cloud, which was probably one of the world's first bigger Wi-Fi operators. We were Europe's largest Wi-Fi operator. 
And we sold that to B Sky B to Rupert Murdoch in 2011 for about 80 million bucks. Um, and so, you know, by by 2008, we'd done quite a lot, you know, <laughs> and um, and so we we knew that we wanted to do another business, um, uh, but we wanted to have a kind of positive impact on the world. We didn't want another 10 years to go by look back and say that was great we made another couple of books um and and so we were looking at around for for something that would be a business but would also have a positive impact on the world and, and i guess the biggest existential crisis in the world is climate change um and so we set up crowley carbon in 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 pretty much 2009 2010 and it's it's one of the biggest players in the world in industrial energy efficiency, headquartered at a Paris Court House, and um, and then that has morphed since into what's called Cool Planet Group. And Cool Planet Group targets the the big three things in climate change. So the big three things are energy, which is Crowley Carbon, uh, transport, which is our car business, and then. Um, food which is some an area that we're getting into because um like the happy pair guys uh know very well meat is meat is nice but meat is not good for the planet and so we've got a new business in in that space and so it's um so the group now has become a bit of a monster it's in 23 countries um offices pretty much everywhere and um you know it's become a proper grown-up business and a very exciting business as well so it seems to me like there's there's a lot of drive there because uh like i was i was thinking to mark here if you know you sell the, the business like i said for 500 million a mill you come back um to ireland kind of you know he, he definitely he kind of made it at that stage um and then that's if i'm getting the timeline right that's kind of like 2008 ish um and then yeah. uh the the carbon business comes out kind of almost it seems like like a bit of overlap there was there or was it there was yeah we've never stopped uh, in any business so we already have when we've sold businesses in the past we already have the next business lined up and um, it's it's not an entirely healthy mental pastime it has to be said um but like even at the moment we like i say we have we have i think we have something like 27 limited different limited companies all together and we we have another six ideas that we'd love to pursue, um, and we just don't have the time. And we have to stop ourselves. And my wife uh, quite rightly stops me too, um, because there's only so many you can play in, you know. But I think we've learned over the years how to how to become better at creating them and running them. And and it's very much a team sport at this stage. The executives in our business are our proper grown ups who do a super job, and so it's easier to, you know, it's easier to create a new idea there's a structure there now um, and we can plug new ideas into that structure yeah. amazing and so in the because i'm really interested in this kind of uh in this kind of the selling the business because when when i was growing up uh entrepreneurship uh when i was in uh like I, my my dad was an entrepreneur when i was in college we learned about that and the, the kind of the process is set out where it's you have a great idea you test the market you sell sell that to customers, and then eventually you go IPO or you go to uh, you sell to private equity, or like you, like you yeah. mentioned, and then you kind of um, live in a, maybe a, a, gated, a gated community, maybe uh, in Florida <laughs> yeah. or Boko Rattan. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Right? That, that sounds really shit. To be honest, yeah. I hate that. <laughs> It doesn't have to be Boko. I don't. I don't know. I don't know where that came from. I don't yeah, know. yeah, yeah. No, I don't know. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> but, uh, but but you know what I mean. Like, is is you, when you were selling the business uh, at that stage, we're kind of like, okay, I'm going to take, you know, we'll take some time here. Uh, yeah, yeah. We, boat. I, I, you know, we we never really took much time off because, you know, serious entrepreneurs and serial entrepreneurs, right? Entrepreneurs that have done it multiple times. Like what you realize is that, you know, like, so let's say in the morning, you know, you, me and Mark set up a business together, you know, wackyraces.com. And then it's a great idea. A couple of years time, we sell it for 300 million in this magical world we're in, there's no tax. So each of us gets a hundred million, right? So, so what do you do? Like, so, right, we've got a hundred million in the morning. We're young enough to enjoy it and healthy enough. So what are we doing? Like, What's the first thing you do with a hundred million? Um, I'd 
I, I just got a big mortgage here in Greystone, so I'll probably knock okay. a few. Clear few the mortgage. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, it's a hundred million, so you better you probably yeah. get a bigger house uh, in the gated community, um, and yeah. you need a holiday home. So, um, yeah. so let's buy one of those. Um, yeah. And then we go shopping, <laughs> the usual stuff. Get some cars. It's always the, nice to donate to charity, right? Um, so what else? You um, with, uh, yeah, I like that. I, I'm, we've got a hundred mil, Mark. What do you think? We can we can cut off a bit for you know. Yeah. To, I think the answer is I do. I do what I love doing. Now for me, it yeah. would be painting or, or traveling around. Yeah, um, I'd probably I'd like to invest in other people as well who have better ideas yeah. than me. That'd yeah. be that'd be what I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and, and I think that's solid. And so the truth is like you go away you do the stuff you wanted to do and then you find out that actually what you kind of wanted to do was work (laughs) and so in your case it's painting and you can you you know you can argue that um because you're passionate about it that you know that it's not work but effectively it's kind of work you're just lucky enough to like what you do at that point you know um and so that's you know people always wonder why we go back to work and and like why why now pull 14, 16 our days, right? Um, but actually it's like, we have a purpose and we're very clear about that purpose. And, and that's why we get up and do that. And, you know, other people listening would say, oh, it's easy for you to say that. And, you know, but, you know, the stuff we do now, like we have a charitable foundation. We had a charitable foundation when we had no money, right? And so it's kind of easy to say, oh, you've made a couple of books, you can do whatever you want. But actually that's, I would challenge that. That's a small bit of a cop out actually. You know, you can, most things you want to do, you can do, you know. Yeah. And what we have found, especially later in life is a bit of a methodology around that, which is we write down what it is we want to do. We communicate that to anybody who will listen. And then the magic happens pretty quickly, actually. People just come to you and say, I'd really love to do that with you, you know. And um, and to a degree, it's not that complicated, you know. And a lot of what you have to do is look after your own mental health, your own physical health, um, and try and stay sane while all of that is happening, you know. And um, I think it's taken us a lot of years to to learn that. And now in the business, we we mind our team's mental health. We we kind of try and inspire in them a vision about where they want to be, and I think we're getting quite good at that actually. Um, and that's having a really positive effect on on the outcomes. But you know, it's a pity that it takes so long to figure this stuff out. Actually, you know, um, it'd be <laughs> well, nice I, to know it at, at fifteen. <laughs> I was going to ask that question as a as a young man from in Clonakilty. Where did you have a vision, or did it just kind of materialize um, bit by bit you know I, I for us back then like i was born in 1970 and you know there was only one channel when we grew up but that one channel had like dallas and these tv shows and at the time in ireland like ireland's a bloody great country and um and you know a lot of people i think don't really respect how amazing ireland is but back then ireland was a bit of a dump and it was it was kind of half a third world country in, in truth you know and so there was very little money and we used to watch dallas on tv and they all had mercedes and yeah. convertibles they also had quite a lot of affairs for some reason <laughs> but um, <laughs> and um and so my vision in the beginning was just get out make some money you know, not be tied down by by that. And and also not be tied down by, you know, at the time it was kind of holy Catholic Ireland and that quite re- repressive thing that went along with that. And so there was a, I wanted very much attracted to the liberal um, thing and still are, um, I guess. And, um, and then you wanted to make money. But then over time, the vision changed. You know, when you make a couple of books, all of a sudden that's not as interesting anymore and you want to do other things. Um, and so, um, but if I had my time back again, I would have figured out what that purpose was a bit earlier if I could, because it's nice to wake up in the morning and just know what it is that you need to get done and, um, and living purposefully, um, is a much easier way to do things. You know, if you've got a, it's like having an internal compass that does, just helps you with that. And I guess over time we've built up tools to help us you know, keep on the straight and narrow in that, in that regard. Yeah. You mentioned as well that the, like there's a, you mentioned the we as, as the, 
has it been the same kind of group of people that are doing these businesses or is there a core group that you've been doing multiple things with over the years? Um, well, the we a lot of the time is is our family. So my wife, especially our, our wider group. And yeah, people, there is no one person who's lasted through all the businesses. Um, but there are people, pretty much everybody has ran through a couple of businesses and then either people want to do their own thing or they retire. Um, but it is always a we, it's never an I. Um, and, you know, when you have an idea, the first thing you do is bounce it off somebody. And um, so there's always a team there doing that. And I think we've gotten better over the years at keeping hold of the teams as well. Um, so definitely for the last 15 years, it's been a lot of the same people, you know. Um, Has it, no, yeah. Sorry, Luke. No, no, I read that you... Um... You've walked on hot coals and all that stuff. Was was there any uh, any Tony Robbins influence in your life? Yeah, I think the original hot coals idea came from Tony Robbins. Actually, um, I like Tony. I think he's a s- small bit of a bullshitter, um, but he has an incredible talent actually to um, to inspire people and to see through people's bullshit. Um, you know, over the years, you go through the cycles of inspirational leaders, everything from Richard Branson, who's who's become a bit of a mate, actually, in the last couple of years, um, all the way through to Tony Robbins, Deepak Chopra. I think what happens over time is you start to find out the flaws and the, and, and the cracks, and then you, you kind of move on, you know. And even now, like I would follow on Twitter, people like Chamath, Pali and Naval Ravikant, um, going through a rich seam of, of kind of Indian originated billionaires at the moment um, who are quite spiritual. Um, I, I kind of laughably say Indian meditating billionaires from the West Coast of the States. <laughs> they, they all seem to be making a lot of sense at the moment. So a myself. billionaire Buddhist out there. Like. Yeah, there's a lot of bit. And like, I'm, I'm, I'm a crazy meditator now. Uh, I'm not religious, um, but I, I'm, I'm very much into meditation. And uh, it's a key part of like what, you know, how, how do you keep going in the middle of lockdown with 16, 17 Zoom calls a day? And, Without meditation, I wouldn't be able to do that. You know, it's it's like focus, energy, you know, everything. And um, and so yeah, there like that's what I was saying earlier about the rules. Like for us, it's kind of um, you know, exercise every single day, meditation pretty much every day, um, take it handy on the booze, take it handy on the food. Um, for me as well, it's keto, so keto diet. Uh, which is mega for focus and energy and that kind of stuff. And so we have, a, yeah. Is that where the, the, the kind of keto stuff, is that, uh, you mentioned that you uh, were up to 18 stone. I don't know how, how tall you are. So but that's okay. yeah, kind of six foot dead. So yeah, yeah 18 yeah. stone. You're a big boy at 18 stone. Yeah, yeah for sure. And, um, and is that the, um, was the keto stuff that? Uh... Yeah, it was. Yeah. And then I kind of forgot it for a couple of years. And then lately uh, through a friend of mine, um, I got back into keto again and it's just fantastic. And and the other weird thing I do is one day a week, I fast 24 hours for kind of health reasons. So, um, so it makes me begin to make me sound like a monk, which I'm not, yeah. I, I, I do like a beer and a good steak. So, um, but, um, yeah. but yeah, I find that especially in these COVID times where lockdown's a bit a thing, uh, it's very stressful for everybody, obviously. And so sticking to the, the rules of the road, which really help with everything, kind of sleep, work, focus, you know, happiness, happiness. Like, you know, I can do, I can do a mile of Zoom calls in a day and, and do most of them with a smile on my face, <laughs> you know? So, yeah, but, it, and and that's why I think, you know, I hear a lot of people on the first lockdown, especially like just spent the first three weeks drinking, which sounds really cool. Um, the problem with that is like, you're just going to wreck your central nervous system. And and so you do what, regardless of what age you are, if you want to get shit done, you you have to have a fairly good regimen, you know. Absolutely. And I think it's really important for people as well, if they I think some, I feel like is obviously some people have the, get the taste for that a little bit more than others. I was lucky. I never really had that, you know, it never, it was, it was I could take or leave it a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like we had a, a baby recently. I don't know. I haven't had a drink in a very long time. I know you because it's locked down anyway. So uh, yeah. it's not been yeah. a big deal for me, but I think when I, if I do kind of overindulge, even uh, to, uh, I would talk about three glasses of wine the next day, 
and my work yeah. is, is is really impacted. I'm, yeah, it is. Yeah. I'm not yeah. bought in as much as I am uh, usually. Yeah. Um, and I think people feel that from you. You're kind of like, you know, they kind of yeah. don't but talk. Yeah, but, yeah, booze is a crappy drug. I, and don't get me wrong, I like booze, but booze is a crappy drug. Like if you think here we are in 2021, and the best we can come up with to to have a bit of crack is is alcohol, and it's calorifically dense. You put on weight, you know, you get a monster hangover from it. It wrecks your central nervous system. Um, it doesn't last, you know, and like, and it's generally bad, you know. And you, you know, some people can't leave it alone. And and you would have thought we at this stage we would have come up with the wonder drug, you know. Friday evening, one yeah. one magic pill, have a good laugh for five or six hours, and then leave it alone. Non addictive. How, how cool would that be, right? And uh, a few options yeah. out there. I think uh, maybe the kids yeah. would fill us in on the on the what, what's going on out there on the streets. But uh, yeah. but the, so the the keto stuff actually it was interesting. With me and Mark, we do kind of experiments on the podcast as well. So we'll do a different type of uh, diet or something for a month or a different type yeah. of workout regime. We never really got around to the keto stuff, and we had. Um, at Dominique Kemp, um, the yeah, I know Dominique very well. Yeah, she's great. Yeah, yeah. Oh, really, we had her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's part of the Entrepreneur of the Year Mafia. Yeah. Oh right. <laughs> yeah. 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 One of the nicest people we've ever spoken to. Really. Yeah. 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 Really uh, beautiful. Person. I keep looking for a flaw in Dominique. I haven't found one yet. Really. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, we, I got her book there uh, recently. Um, so the the keto kitchen. So maybe Mark will, will give that a go and kind of report back. Yeah, to... to me the keto one is the killer app because like I was watching Operation Transformation last night and like doing I was watching the diets people were on and doing kind of sugary like they were still eating kind of sugary breakfast cereal and stuff and what are you doing like you know like sugar is an addiction and so if your diet doesn't involve killing sugar completely what are you you're messing like you're absolutely messing and it doesn't work and it won't last and it makes it so tough to do that kind of diet you know so uh, whereas like keto from a deeply scientific level um, has been proven to have massive kind of positive effects you know so yeah, and I'm sure there are other diets equally as good, but yeah, for some reason it definitely suits suits me. You know, yeah. It's interesting you mentioned that on the kind of the the almost game show style weight loss uh, shows uh, on TV. Not yeah. not much yeah. the transformation, but you know the American ones and stuff. Mm. Sometimes I'm thinking a lot of the things that they're doing aren't healthy either. Either like crazy restriction where they're never going to be able to stick to that, where it's no. deprivation and they yeah. don't fall all that type of stuff. And then also, I used to, like when I was in college, I worked in a, uh, a gym and uh, I worked actually very briefly when I moved to Canada um, in Gold's gym just for, uh, well, I was waiting yeah. for something bigger. But um, they, yeah. the people who are really out of, uh, out of shape, uh, like uh, where it's a health concern, they're doing, all, they're, they're doing like uh, personal training with people that are, like they're doing exercises that all the fit people aren't really doing. That's what yeah. I always think, like they're not lifting weights. So they're like, doing bizarre things on medicine balls and then <laughs> sort of run up and down and stuff like well yeah. all the people aren't doing that why yeah. because yeah. you're that size if they just yeah. ate what you're saying there as well like some sort of uh, regimented diet have some sort of plan uh, and yeah. do what act how fit people act eventually yeah. the two will uh, they'll work yeah the, the other thing i love is the ch- the cheat day so it's my wife's birthday tomorrow now so we are gonna cheat the shit out of that one you know and then <laughs> I think doing that one day a week, you know, is just works really, really well. And uh, the one I'm playing with at the moment is just something I read is, um, so the Peloton bike is a killer app if you can get it, especially in lockdown, you know, it's a, it works really, really well. And then what to do is do, do 30 minutes of Peloton and then get off and do one muscle group each day to fail. So for about 10 minutes. So you get off the bike, one muscle group to fail and then move on. And it's, I've only been doing it now for a fortnight, but it seems to be working out quite well, you know, um, so. That's cool as well, because people, it's, it's, it is tough to get it in when you're, when it's on lockdown. I've got something similar. I've got like a, a smart trainer for my bike that I put it on. I've got the, yeah. the uh, Zwift app, you know, where I'm going up, uh, yeah. Uh, Mont Fon too, Mark. Uh, I'm trying yeah, to be. Yeah. My, my wife's worrying about the the panting and the. It doesn't look like it's going <laughs> to happen. But anyway, so uh, <laughs> going back to uh, back back to a bit of business here, right? So yeah. I actually never actually got into the the current business. I know that it's a uh, um, uh, uh, curly um, uh, carbon. Um, yeah. When 
I was looking into it and I never really came across a business like this before. I guess it's the, the management of how big buildings are uh, managing their, their energy resource and stuff like that. Mm. In a nutshell, what would the, the business be doing? So the energy business, so we break it into energy transport um, and in our, we have an education division as well. So energy is energy efficiency. It's, it's run by a guy called Alan Kill, great entrepreneur. And, um, and what we do there is shockingly in the world, about 80% of the energy that we consume is wasted every year. So $3 trillion is wasted um, every year. And that's across transport, across energy. So what that business does is we have a software technology that we plug into factories and buildings and it, notices the second that you've wasted energy. So it figures out you're wasting energy right now. This is exactly how you're wasting that energy. And then it just annoys the absolute heart out of you until you fix it. And um, to give you an idea for our biggest customer, which is one of the biggest makers of glass in the world, we're saving them a hundred million dollars a year in energy. So it's just insane. And um, and we the software originates out of HQ and Powers Court. And so we do everything from, we monitor the tallest building in the world, the biggest shopping mall in the world, some of the biggest factories in the world. And, um, and that's all done out of Paris Court. And um, the software platform is called Clarity and it's very cutting edge. And then we also help customers with projects. So if they wanna do a project to put in solar or to put in a new more efficient boiler or chiller, then we'll, we'll help them with that project and make sure it works okay. And then if they don't have any money, so if the customer says, look, I'd love to save a lot of money, but um, I don't have the money to do that, then we provide the capital. So we have a business called Cool Planet Capital and it, it does what's called shared savings. So we'll, we'll say, look, we're going to save you a million bucks. We'll take a half a million, you take the other half. Um, and so um, thankfully that's been really, really good. And then... A couple of years ago, well, in 2019, we we noticed the rise and rise of electric vehicles. And from an engineering point of view, an electric vehicle makes perfect sense, right? A normal car is is incredibly inefficient, right? It's uh, internal combustion as a way of moving you around is crap, right? Um, it's at best, it's about a 28% efficient process. Um, whereas an electric car is about a 92 to 96 percent efficient process and they're much more fun they're much quicker Um, and so we wanted to get into electric cars but we knew we were too late because tesla make an exceptional product and and some of the others do as well Um, so we were looking for an angle and we felt that there were two things we noticed one was specialist vehicles so you know land rovers that go down a mine for instance um, and and there was an opportunity there but and the other cooler opportunity was classic cars so if you think about any car that you would buy today they're just a plastic box running down the road whereas classic cars have always been beautiful but the problem with classic cars is they break a lot right Um, and so we got the idea of electrifying classic cars and, and that business is called Electrify. Um, and that's become a huge business now. So we've just opened actually the manufacturing. We, ha- we already have a factory in Wales and we've just opened the factory in Powers Court. And um, that's, in fact, yesterday we released a video um, and it was the most famous car designer in the world, Ian Callum talking about electrify, talking about the nature of classic cars and the opportunity around electrifying them. And so in the next couple of years, we're gonna build the first cars um, uh, in Ireland since the DeLorean basically. Um, And um, so we launched a brand yesterday, it's called AVA, um, which stands for Ad Vitam Eternum, um, which means life eternal. Um, and so those cars are going to, the first ones of those are going to roll out of Paris Court um, in 2022. And it's a real stake in the ground for Ireland, actually, because the cars um, are, the, you know, it's not some flaky bunch of lads um, coloring in a couple of cars up in Paris Court. It's like the cars will be designed by two of the most famous car designers in the world. Um, and they will be some of the fastest and most beautiful cars in the world. Yeah. So, um, so would they be classic, like based on classic car designs? Yeah, they're the- going to be 
reimagined classic cars, but they they look roughly the same, but they also look like a modern car. And they, like these things are what we call weapons. Like they are incredibly powerful. So one of them is 2000 brake horsepower. So this thing is... <laughs> rocket but, uh, is, there, is an absolute is, rocket ship yeah. is there anywhere online we can we can see them yet or um we're going to be slowly releasing images of the cars in the next couple of months actually as we announce the designers coming on board as well and it's a proper what i'm excited by is you know ireland's been apologizing for its existence for a lot of years i think it comes from you know being being ruled by everyone from the vikings to, to our local neighbors for a lot of years and i think we're finally coming of age and so you'll see here the announcements like these are world class announcements with some of the most famous designers in the world um and so it's it's fantastic just to be able to you know, to be able to say this is happening in Ireland, in Paris Court. And it continues to blow us away, to be honest with you, the the fact that we can pull this off, you know. And um, so so that's, we're incredibly excited about that. And um, and so that's, that's the one probably with the most excitement around it at the moment. And then back to kind of, one of the things about climate change, the reason we're in education, so we opened Cool Planet Experience in Paris Court, which is the first uh, climate education um, center in the world, actually, um, a visitor attraction. And we opened that, Richard Branson opened it in, um, in 2018, in late 2018. And it got 30,000 visitors in 2019. So it was a huge success. And, and then we had to close it because of COVID. But what we had managed to get together was just a brilliant bunch of people who are really good educators. And so what we're doing now is building out an education platform around climate change, but also around a lot of other stuff like mental health um, and and, uh, financial health as well. Um, And the reason we're doing that is because we're, we actually think that we will solve climate change, not us, but that the world will solve climate change in the next 10 years. In fact, we're very confident about, about our, our ability to do that. Not Again, I stress not just us, but, but a lot of other people. And um, But we're also very worried about what social media is doing to the world. And you saw last week in the US with that thing in the Capitol building, like we're we're just splitting the world in two and we're forgetting a lot of the things that are truths about the world. And so the idea of the education platform is, is to just uh, try and help people to make sense of what's going on because social media is brilliant at connecting us all together and helping us promote stuff and all of that. But also there's a quote, I don't know if you've seen the social dilemma on Netflix, but like there's a disturbing side effect of this, you know, which is we're splitting up as a human race. And so wouldn't it be an awful shame if we got to 2030 and we'd solve climate change, one of the most existential threats that had ever hit us and we'd created free energy and free transport and, and foods that don't impact the world. And, and then we just ripped each other apart anyway, just for the crack, you know? And, and so the education platform, we're working with some heavy hitters around the world to really help us as humans figure out that we are actually all one and that we can all get along and, and then help us educate ourselves in the process of doing that. So, so Vicky, who, who is running Cool Planet Experience, is the chief executive of our education group. And that's been, that's been a fascinating thing. That all came about during lockdown as a business, but it's taken on a complete life of its own. When we explain it to people, they just get blown away. They want to be involved, you know, and so, so it's very exciting. It seems like it's good to you're not only looking after the uh, the planet there, but you're actually looking after the people running the planet. So that's a, another, yeah. another one of yeah. my friends said recently yeah, with the after the the US thing. He said, uh, "I wish there was an alien invasion so we can uh, realize everyone's on the same team." You know, yeah. like it's yeah. it, it's very yeah. uh, and and even if you look at like uh, an equivalent to the alien invasion is actually COVID, right? So, so this existential threat comes along that can kill a whole lot of people. And, and we decide that one side will wear masks and the other side won't. It's la- it would be, if it wasn't so serious, it'd be laughable. You know? yeah. and, and it's proof that we need this education platform and we need to figure it out because we will, like, it's no joke, like we will solve some of these major global problems. Like 
if you think about some of the technologies we're working on, like solar, um, we're we're working on a cellular agricultural technology that would allow you to free feed people in Africa for free. So basically, you you take a and you take a, a biodigester, you it can suck air from from the air and create a food, and people will never have to worry about food again. So you can do free energy, free food, free transport with electric. Um, so we get there with all of this stuff. Let's say it takes us until 2035 and we go, woohoo, we got here. Let's rip the shit out of each other over, over what? Over, over some crazy idea. And some of the people being interviewed last week outside the Capitol, the guy with the crazy horns and the furs, like, like it's just incredible to watch. So there isn't any doubt that we could get everything that we always wanted and still kill each other. You know, um, I don't think there's any doubt, in fact, unless we can figure out a way to stop that from happening, you know. Interesting problems to try to solve as well. But you yeah, mentioned that yeah. there's a good few uh, issues there. Like, say, say if you were, you know, uh, you were looking at, so I know you got a lot of, it seems like you got a lot on your plate, Norman, there. So I'm not going to throw yeah, any of that. Yeah, I think that's partially there, but... the problem, to be honest. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. You've got a few kind of uh, buns in the oven there. But mm-hmm. what's, what would you say, say if there's uh, young people in uh, in Ireland who are, um, are confident they want to start start a business they want to help uh, help the world where's where's your your money going if you are investing in those people um is it in wave energy in the west is it in like what's no. the what's the area that you'd uh, be looking at look there's so many areas um we, we have a we have a family office when you when you um when you make a couple of books, uh, one of the things you end up with is a family office. Um, so, and then you have to mind your money and make investments. And so we have very strict criteria in that. We have 10 areas um, that we're investing in and, um, and only those 10 areas. And they're kind of obvious. So like anything to do with the digitalization of the world e-commerce um, and it would be one area everything that's going digital. So that could be anything from payments to IT e-commerce. Um, and then uh, all the way through to green energy, um, specifically not wave energy. Um, okay. So our our energy stuff is very much focused on what we call SWB, which is solar wind battery, because we think those areas are going to work. Um, and then digital healthcare. Uh, I'm chairman of a company called Occupo, which thankfully is a very successful I can't take any credit, uh, Leo, if you're listening, um, uh, but it's working in digital healthcare. It's hyper successful. Um, and um, so anything in that area. So the, they're the kind of hot topics, climate change in the wider sense, food, uh, especially low carbon food. Uh, we're very focused on that. So, um, so yeah, they're the areas that we're focusing on. And in terms of advice, you know, you were asking the question, Mark, earlier about firewalking. Um, we kind of distilled down, and, and this, this has appeared, or I've done public talks with this, but, you know, when you learn how to walk on hot coals, you learn how to get over um, fear. It's not like I'm fearless, um, but you, you certainly learn to handle fear a bit better. But how they teach you to succeed in walking on hot coals um, is very similar to how you would teach somebody to succeed in business and perhaps in life. And the first thing they teach you is, you know, so how hot coals works is you, you get 30 ton of timber, you put it in a big pile, you light a match, you burn it down and then it ends up in embers. And then you rake out the embers to about 30 feet of, of hot coals. And there are all these weird theories about it's not really that hot and all of that. And so in order to, and I used to teach people how to do it, um, in order to get over that thing about maybe it's not that hot, you 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 say to people, hey, if I had a rasher, how long would it take to cook this that rasher in this bed of hot coals? And people go, ah, oh, it would take five minutes, ten minutes, and then you throw the rasher into the hot coals, and it just incinerates, right? So it just you get a puff of smoke and it's gone, right? <laughs> so anyone anyone doubting that it's not hot uh, is pretty clear at that point, and so the first thing we teach people is to fill your mind with happy thoughts, right? Because, and when you wake up in the morning in the middle of COVID, you can put on the radio and listen to the world's fucked, um, or you can listen to a podcast like your good selves, um, or or you can follow people who are who are positive, um, or you know all those people, Tony Robbins, Deepak Chopra. Like, what are you what are you tuning into, and who? 
who as well are you choosing to spend your time with, right? And our day full of the joys of spring. And it's not about blind optimism. It's just about, you know, tuning into people who are working hard and achieving in whatever area, be it in charity, be it in, you know, minding, you know, somebody who needs to be minded. It doesn't have to be high flying business. Um, so that's the first one. The, the second one then is there's no point in walking on hot coals if you don't know where you're going. Because if you walk halfway across and then decide to take a left and a right, you'll have no feet left. Um, and we all talk about goals all the time. But the thing people, people say, write down your goals. But the thing pretty much everybody misses is you have to think about what it is you want to do. But the trickier thing is you have to have the courage to communicate that. So when we set off, started off Crowley Carbon in 2010, we said we're going to be the biggest energy efficiency company in the world. And everybody laughed because we didn't have a clue, right? Um, but if you say that out loud repeatedly, you, you know, sadly about 70, 80% of people will laugh, but about 10% of people will join you. And they'll say, you know, I know a guy who knows about energy efficiency, you give him a shout, right? Um, and so having the courage to communicate your goal publicly, despite being laughed at is probably one of the most critical things because that's how you gather your army together and your allies. And Gandhi famously said about change, um, he said, first they mock you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. And that is so true, you know? And so that first step of you communicating what it is you want to achieve and then people mocking you, that's the process, right? And you have to go through that process. And so that's a critical one. And then the final one is keep fucking walking, right? Because <laughs> walking on our goals is, it's a little bit scary. It's a lot scary. And, um, and, and so you have to keep going, you know, and especially in these COVID times, like you can't give up. And, and, you know, we're big believers in hard work. You know, it doesn't have to be like it's a bit like painting. It doesn't have to feel like work, um, but you have to keep at it all the time. And um, and you can't cheat success, right? You can, sometimes you can make money by not working that hard, um, but success is different to money. And success, you got to work at it, you know? And so hard work is a critical thing. And so they're, they're the kind of three bits of advice that that I've been able to distill it down into for people. And I think if you can manage to do those things, you'll be, you'll win, but also you'll be happy in the process. I love that idea about the, about the courage to tell people that you're, uh, what, the, what the idea is, what the goal is. Like, yeah. it, it, no one has distilled it, like, like you said, uh, on the, like you just said there uh, on the podcast that we've interviewed. But it did remind me of uh, one of our, our guests, uh, Garrett Flower, who was a guy who owned a, uh, a set of bakeries in Dublin called Crust. I don't know if you're familiar with Garrett. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. He, uh, and then he just, he, he wanted to get into uh, software for, for parking. So he just kept, like he said that to a few people. Then he just randomly met somebody who could build that for him. And now he's, you know, selling to Fortune 500 companies. And mm. it's the, like, he had no background in that. And it was just like, he put that out. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about the law of attraction here, but I'm talking to, if, if no one, if you don't have a flag up, it's hard for people to see completely uh, where yeah. to go you know? yeah yeah so. completely how would they know about you otherwise unless you're crazy enough to, to say it you know and there's you know my favorite irish entrepreneur and, and you should get him on the podcast i can help you get him on if you want uh, is stephen klusky so stephen um uh, amazing entrepreneur um he had an accident when he was 18 um paralyzed from the neck down and he's on his third business now um and he is just so like, if you want to see, you know, people listening, maybe, and they've got a job or they have to mind kids or whatever, the reason why you can't be an entrepreneur, um, like have a listen to Stephen Klusky, like, and then tell me why you can't fucking do it after listening to Stephen. Like he is such an inspiration, you know? And so, um, you know, the, there's no excuse um, for, for anybody in any situation, just get on with it, you know? And, um, and uh, like, I, I, whenever, I don't want to hear anyone's story about why they can't, like after meeting Stephen and he's quite an inspiration to me and, um, you know, just get on with it. Yeah. I love that as well, because there's a lot of, a lot of people out there as well who are kind of the entrepreneurs or they've always had ideas and they say, you know, I've got this, you know, got a couple of kids at home, like I said, 
<laughs> even though a lot of entrepreneurs seem to have children as well. That's what I'm saying, Mark. Really. Well, there's <laughs> a million <laughs> reasons why you shouldn't do something. And look. Yeah, yeah. I, I heard one a couple of years ago, you know, CrossFit and the, the lady who won the CrossFit Games. <laughs> and she... Um, and she won the CrossFit Games and you immediately kind of go, uh, well, I'm sure she's got feck all else to do. And then it turned out like she had three or four kids and then it turned out she had some huge job, you know, and you're just kind of going, okay, are there any questions? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it seems like it's, uh, it's, it's the people that have a lot on their plate that are, are uh, getting things done out there. So uh, yeah. very interesting. There is that yeah. analogy about if you want something done, ask a busy person, you know. <laughs> <laughs> if you, if you, so there, there was one thing that I, I came across. I know we're kind of pushing time here as well, but it's so interesting. Yeah. The, um, the, you mentioned that in another interview that I uh, that I watched, where you're setting up the sales environment for uh, Crowley uh, Carbon, so that yeah. it's kind of a no brainer for the end user. Was that something that you uh, came up with beforehand? Say it's got to be a, a clear cut thing, or was it just that the type of business and the type of solution you had was a uh, uh, no, I mean, what, what we do in all the businesses is, is you just, you take away all the objections, ultimately. And once you take away all the objections, then you've got a pretty good chance of selling. And uh, and that takes time, sadly, to build up the expertise to be able to take away all the objections. But in, in pretty much everything we do, um, we do that. When we had the gambling business, like, you know, the platform worked really, really well. But the in the Asian market, for some reason, they just didn't want the platform, and it was it made no sense that they wouldn't want this platform. So what we did was we said, why don't we set up our own casino and show them how amazing it is on our, in our own casino? So we set up a casino in in Laos in VNTN, and um, and it was such a big success that we didn't bother selling to the Asians. <laughs> we just set up our own casinos. <laughs> Um, and by the time we sold the business, we had about 16 casinos in Asia. <laughs> so, um, it was a side hustle almost out there. In, uh, it was, yeah, it was a side hustle. <laughs> oh, my um, God. Really, okay, so it's, uh, maybe there might be a, a part two in the, in the future. I know yeah. we're, we're pushing time here. I, I just remembered something, actually. You know, you were saying that you, you nerd out on, on diets and trying diets and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I show you the latest weirdness. Um, you you broadcast this as an audio podcast or a video and audio podcast? No, video and audio. So the, the, the okay, audio. Okay. Well. Let's do a visual then, right? So okay. I'll show you something. Like, I'm gonna take my clothes off here. You don't know where this is going now, do you? This is hang on. This is the first for the shark pod, but I like where this is going. Uh, <laughs> going off YouTube. <laughs> so now the question is: Can I? Can you see that? Yeah. I can see, I can see uh, some sort of um, a plastic. Uh, I think on, on, so for, the, for the visuals that we're pointing at uh, uh, Norman's arm, he's got some sort of implant, it looks like. Yeah. So that's, um, that's called a freestyle Libra. Uh, diabetics use them to do glucose. But what I'm doing with it is it, it's called CGM. So I'm taking my phone and I'm tapping it off it. There you go. And so that gives me real time my glucose levels. And so you track them. 24 seven, basically your glucose levels. And then you get to learn what foods um, cause your glucose to spike and not. So, um, and is that different for other different people, I wonder? Yeah, it's different for everybody. So I could eat a sourdough loaf of bread and it wouldn't drive my glucose up and you could eat the same loaf and be in a diabetic coma. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, we got to. That's his next level shit now, Mark. We need to. Uh, is this know. a prototype or is this on the market? Oh no, you can buy them. Off. It's Abbott Labs have them. You can buy them online. They're about fifty quid ago, and um, and they last a fortnight. And you you wouldn't do it every fortnight, but you can do it every now and then. Yeah. Um, I think it's wacky. I like I've I've had it for a fortnight. And um, it makes me feel weirdly like a cyborg or something. <laughs> Just like sticking in there. <laughs> It's the first thing I thought. I thought it's kind of like kind of by one step towards the bionic man, the kind of uh, the kind yeah. of singularity. You know, it's going to be uh, yeah. Well, like, very, like the more, and more Earth, though. it's yeah. kind of weirdly. Yeah, I wouldn't be at his league, but yeah, it's that. And nowadays, like you have your watch and your phone and your thing stuck on your arm, and and like it's a crazy, uh, it's a crazy scene that's that's happening. You know. Um, but it's funny because if you think about it, I, I, Greystones always reminds me of it. Actually, you think about Ireland twenty years ago, and like we'd all go into the pub for a few pints, and now you go around Greystones, especially, and every fecker is running and cycling and triathlons and all this. And if you're well, like, I visited Luke a while ago. I was like, 
everybody is wearing yo- some sort of yoga pants or sport pants around here. <laughs> we're all trying. We're trying to do. We're trying to good, live a good life out here, Mark. I don't, this is why people move. Do you know what, do you know what uh, Norman? I feel like it's like you opt in when you move to Greystones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, that's why. So that's why we're. It's kind of a self, prof- uh, you know, um, filing pro- prophecy or whatever. Like, no. All the people around us are having. It's all kind of like young families who like to swim, and they like. That's why. That's why we moved here um, so actually it's funny that you said the triathlon thing because i started triathlon when i moved here um yeah. just because yeah. just, then you start to know, uh, know people around it's a great area wicklow anyway for that type of training it is no yeah. like some gray stones has become the beverly hills you know and um uh, apart from Enniscary, obviously which is definitely the beverly hills <laughs> but i see i so i thought i was quite posh actually when i bought my, my little house here in uh in gray stones right and then so i'm in the new developments up on the up in the hills right so yeah, yeah. views and everything like that and my friend who's like a real gray stones uh you know old gray stones you know um yeah. and he he's he said that uh, I, I told him where i was living i said i'm moving into this gray stones we're gonna be mates we'll, we'll see each other all the time he goes oh where's your house and i said oh it's up you know up on the hills uh you know and he goes oh they, we call them the favelas uh, around here <laughs> and i was like ah, the fuck? go on I've never heard that. That is yeah. so funny. Yeah. As, as, here, listen, we're doing our best. We're trying to fit in. And, uh, you know, I, it's, yeah. it's you know a little bit nicer than that. But anyway, yeah. um, well, sorry, on that point, people in Northern Ireland call us Mexicans. Really? South of the border, I guess. South of the border, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they've got a I've, I've been to mexico i can see where their point is i feel like I've have, i have an affinity to those people um when we were traveling around uh, for a couple of years me and my wife we were saying that uh if we were going to come back as anything it would be, come back as a latin american i feel like they're real just yeah. super laid back big on family yeah, 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 yeah. there's a lot to be said, said. Yeah, yeah there's some very cool spots down down south of the border there <laughs> okay but um yeah. So, yeah, so like we could talk for, <laughs> talk for ages about uh, any type of uh, you know electric cars, gaming, uh, uh, adventures in uh, Laos. Uh, I'm sure that there's, there's more stories around yeah. uh, becoming cyborgs. Uh, yeah, cyborgs. In, in another podcast, we will talk about living forever. Um, there's another mild obsession, which is um, which is the, nowadays we are probably the first generation that might possibly live forever. Uh, and um, that's another podcast. We're <laughs> definitely doing that podcast, Norm. Let's let's leave it on that bombshell. That's the that's the, the cliffhanger, right? Uh, Norm, and then we'll do one on on how you're gonna try get to Mars, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I will leave that to Elon yeah. <laughs> and maybe uh, Jeff. <laughs> no, listen, hopefully next time I next time we talk to you, me and Mark are uh, doing doing a little bit more here. I feel like we need to up our game. We need to get out there, start ten companies, uh, make a half a billion. Let's get go, Mark. Let's get going. Let's talk about it after the podcast. But Norman, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to have a chat with you today. Likewise. And, um, there is one more question. I know, listen, Norman, I know you've been on about 17, 18 uh, uh, Zoom calls today. You're making, you know, you're making decisions on those. There's one more decision that we're going to kind of push you for here on this shark pod, okay? And we've got a bit of a tradition okay. here. Would you prefer uh, a shark pod t-shirt that looks like Mark's t-shirt? Or, yeah, or this one. Which is actually has sharks on it, or would you prefer a, a shark pod mug? Jeez, that's yeah. a difficult one. I think on balance, uh, a t shirt is the way to go. Thank you. You've <laughs> already got the gym shark one on there, our, our rival. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Our um, Other brand. We, <laughs> we hired a new um, videographer to do social stuff, Ben Keeley, who's fantastic, and he he recommended this and. Um, and so I, I, I did, it and it's very nice, actually. <laughs> so, I wonder yeah. if we'll try to get a gym shark thing, and we'll try to do a print of that. Uh, Mark, Mark's the design guy; he's going to look after that. But like I said, Norman, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, let's, listen, let's let's do it. Let's do a part two, living forever. We, we, yeah. we never very even happy. have to do the the quick fire question. So uh... that'd be <laughs> yeah, no, no, look, happy to come back on again if anybody if anyone listens to this one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think a few people cool. out there. Okay. All right. Take Thanks, easy, guys. Have a Thank good you very much. Talk to you later. Bye. 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 Bye.